First of all, thank you everybody for being on time. Thank you, for pre Professor, for saving uh, some time of your busy schedule to okay. teach us about growth mindset. And ladies, let me tell you how I met Professor Niall. So I, when I was at Stanford, one of the chances I had was to visit the business school and not only to visit, but actually to take classes. And I was in a class called uh, leadership, high performance leadership, something that I really, really aim to become a very good uh, leader for you know, growth and impact. So it was high performance because I think Chica's is high performance. And then I was very straightforward, wanting to, to grab everything from the beginning without knowing anything. I just wanted to put myself in the risk of being okay with taking uh, chances. And one time I took too many chances and I didn't really know how to do it because I've never been to a business school before. And Niall came to save me. He says, he said, look, I'm, I'm changing team. I'm joining your team and I'm here to support you. And this was life changing for me. And it was the beginning of a really, really deep and uh, I must say uh, very dear to me friendship. And uh, Professor Niall became Niall <laughs> and he actually uh, is and wants to bring Chicas Poderosas to, to Beirut, uh, Lebanon and to Dubai and start conquesting the Arabic uh, sides of Europe and of Asia, like in between, make the connection. So. Nael has brought to us a couple of uh, very good journalists from Lebanon who attended one of our events. And ever since, Nael has been the driving force of bringing chicas to that side of the world. Uh, so this is the first attempt for us to get more involvement together. And I let it to you. Uh, professor is expert in growth mindset and how to use uh, the neuroscience to impact your leadership style. So I think it's very meaningful today. To continue with, with nails so thank you so much for your time thank you so much mariana i really appreciate it uh, and i'm really uh, pleased and honored to be here with you today uh, as mariana said my background is in molecular neuroscience uh, i used to work on uh, motor neuron diseases and then i uh, started becoming more interested in education uh, and brain development uh, so uh, that's how I, in Stanford, I got to know more about the growth mindset. And uh, I thought of the growth mindset as a very, very interesting topic, mostly because it doesn't just focus on the emotions uh, and the psychology of success, but also it correlates that with uh, brain science, neuroscience, which is my specialization. Uh, after meeting Mariana uh, in the circumstances that were very fortunate to both of us, uh, I uh, got to know more about Chicas Poderosas and I became very passionate about Chicas because I come from a region in the world where uh, uh, females uh, and women in general uh, need a lot of empowerment. Uh, they are stereotyped against, uh, but they also uh, don't have the basic rights uh, to actually achieve what they uh, their full potential. So I still and I remain a very passionate uh, ambassador of Chicas Poderosas. Uh, in the Middle East, and hopefully we'll be able to actually achieve that pretty much uh, as soon as possible, as soon as uh, our, uh, our resources align and uh, are available. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking to you about mindsets, as I mentioned, uh, about uh, recent discoveries in neuroscience uh, that are capable of unleashing more creativity and fostering creativity, not just in us as leaders, but also uh, for us as, uh, as professionals in our uh, everyday life. Uh, and uh, those uh, resources and those discoveries are very important in uh, uh, standing up to stereotypes and challenging them. And as women in uh, journalism, uh, you uh, know more than I do uh, that you actually face a lot of stereotypes. And this has been increasing because uh, recently journalism has become an area where uh, evolving technologies uh, now demand that journalists not only are capable of presenting, reporting the news, and writing the news. They, are, uh, they need to be capable of actually using technologies like coding, programming, uh, taking videos, taking uh, images. Uh, so uh, it's an area where uh, women are even more stereotyped against uh, in STEM in general. So let's start from the beginning. What are stereotypes? Uh, that would be a good, uh, a good way for us to, to start our conversation. Um, Human beings in general tend to form positive stereotypes uh, of those uh, that they resemble. Uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, negative stereotypes of those that are different from them. Uh, they create in-groups uh, and out-groups, people who are like us and those that are not like us. And generally speaking, uh, these uh, views of people who are not like them are mostly negative. Uh, and these stereotypes are then used to explain behaviors, not only of groups, but also of individuals within those groups. So essentially, they reduce complex realities uh, into uh, simple uh, causes of human behavior uh, and single factors. Uh, these stereotypes, though, are very difficult to overcome. Uh, they are difficult to suspend because they are also typically linked to strong emotions, uh, whether they are positive emotions or negative emotions, depending on the nature of the stereotype. Uh, when these stereotypes, and I'm talking about both positive and negative, are used to explain behavior uh, and to evaluate performance, uh, to also predict potential, of individuals, they become dangerous and they become flawed. And that's why it's very important for us to understand the framework of how these stereotypes evolve. Uh, and we're doing that in the field of higher education where, where I'm currently working. But it's also important for us to know how we can face these stereotypes and how we can stand up to them and overcome them because they uh, form burdens and challenges to us uh, in our work environment. And as I said earlier, stereotypes are not facing uh, women in, uh, in journalism alone. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that is general, general, uh, a general attitude uh, that women have to face and deal with uh, in STEM in general, in science, technology, engineering, and math. And I thought I'd highlight some of the numbers that are striking uh, to, uh, to show you how much these stereotypes can actually be detrimental to the progress of, uh, of women. Uh, only 7.6% of architect and engineering managers in the United States are women, 7.6%. Uh, only 26.3% of CEOs are women, uh, and 21.4% of computer programmers are women. All these numbers, you can read the rest, only 15.1% uh, uh, girls graduate from uh, STEM uh, uh, majors are, are females they don't reflect skill levels. So when we do testing uh, of the skill levels using standardized tests, uh, we know that uh, women actually are, are not uh, uh, any less capable uh, than, than men, uh, but their self-concept is different. So their, their concept of their abilities uh, is less than that with, with boys uh, in general. And that's usually due to stereotyping. Uh, it's due to socialization. They grow up thinking that they are not as capable. They are told all the time that they are not capable. And when they are capable and when they do well, they are uh, tend to be thought of and they think of themselves as being the exception, which is not the case. And it's important to understand that these perceptions are also culture specific. So I come from the Middle East. When it comes to mathematics, for example, a field where in the United States is thought to be uh, as something men are, uh, are very capable in. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, girls uh, are thought uh, to be very capable uh, and they are thought to be smarter than men, actually. And that's why you see that in engineering schools, either 50% or the majority of schools in the Middle East, in Lebanon specifically, are female, they are girls, which is quite the opposite here in the United States specifically in the Bay Area, which is very striking. So they are culture specific, just like stereotypes. So how can we face them and how can we overcome them? Because that becomes the challenge for us to change the society that we live in and to also uh, not be burdened uh, by them. Uh, it's very important to understand how we can overcome stereotypes. And one of the ways that we can do that, in my opinion, is understanding mindsets. Now, the mindset research was started initially by Stanford professor Carol Dweck. Uh, Carol uh, was uh, trying to uh, understand uh, the difference between individuals or students. That's how she, how she started. She was looking at school students and trying to decipher and understand how and why some students are very successful and resilient to challenges. If they fail, they try again and they keep going. And other students are very vulnerable uh, in the face of any difficulty, uh, they give up and stop trying, and that down the line leads to their failure. So she was trying to understand why are these differences and why do they exist. Uh, and she found out that essentially there are two types of people. There are people who have a fixed mindset, 
And these are individuals who think of intelligence as being something uh, that is given to you. Uh, it is a quantity that stays with you and doesn't change with time. And there are individuals who think of intelligence as something that you can grow, that you can foster, that you can develop. Uh, and she noticed a number of differences between those two uh, sets of communities or individuals. One that down the line leads to success, more success, more growth, and more development. And the other uh, is uh, leads you down the line of failure, uh, vulnerability, and uh, more anxiety and negative emotions and effect. Now, what's special about mindsets for me as a new scientist was the fact that it makes that bridge and link from psychology all the way to neuroscience and brain development uh, uh, and, uh, and neuroplasticity which we'll talk about uh, later in the, in the presentation today uh, by the way if you need to ask me any question please you can interrupt me uh, and uh, and i can i happily answer so uh, so understanding mindsets was very important to me uh, but first of all Let's try to tell you what she found. How are people with a growth mindset different from people with a fixed mindset? As I said, people with a fixed mindset think of intelligence as a quantity that is given to you. You are born with it. Uh, they are told when they are young that they are smart uh, and that sticks with them and they think of them for the rest of their lives as being smart individuals. And they try to protect that identity. They try their best all the time to reflect to these around them, the people around them, that they are smart. Uh, or if they are told the opposite, if they're told that they're not good enough, then that also sticks with them because they think they have a certain amount of intelligence and they can do nothing about it to change it and to develop it. While people with a growth mindset don't think of intelligence that way. They think of intelligence as the result of effort and therefore they are capable of developing, growing and learning more. Uh, whether uh, they know something or they don't know it, the idea is not to reflect an image of being intelligent. Uh, intelligent. The idea is that they want to learn to become intelligent. So they want to put the effort in order to understand and in order to uh, to grow. Uh, and the uh, the the goal for them is not reflecting an image of intelligence. When it comes to the brain, people with a fixed mindset think of the brain as a fixed entity. Uh, they think that the brain stops developing at a certain period, at a certain age, which is something that as neuroscientists, we believed in for decades uh, in the 20th century. Uh, while people with a growth mindset understand or think of the brain just like a muscle, that you can train it, you can develop it, and you can make it stronger. And to do that, you have to always engage in intellectual pursuit, and you, can, you have to always try to uh, learn new skills so that you can develop your brain and its abilities. I'll also touch a little bit upon that later on in the presentation. Uh, but that's a very important difference in understanding the brain between fixed mindset versus growth mindset. When it comes to anxiety, people with a fixed mindset usually are very anxious uh, and uh, their uh, emotional uh, well-being is usually threatened. And the reason that is the case is because they care a lot about the image that they try to reflect to other people. Uh, they learn something to impress others. Uh, they are usually shy away and they try to not engage in new challenges because they are afraid of failure. So they are afraid of failure because they don't want to disappoint themselves. They associate failure with something that uh, is very personal. Uh, so failure becomes a reflection on their abilities and a reflection of their, uh, on their, their character. While people with a growth mindset usually are more open to new challenges, to new experiences, uh, and they think of these challenges and mistakes as opportunities to learn. They essentially think of making mistakes as an essential, uh, essential, essential sorry, uh, part of the learning process. So they enjoy the learning process and don't focus on making mistakes because whether they make mistakes or not does not reflect on their image. They're not too worried and embarrassed uh, with the mistakes that uh, they make. And the last is, uh, well, it's not the last, but one of the major differences is uh, being judgmental. So just like, uh, uh, just like we said, people with a fixed mindset judge themselves uh, and they are afraid to make mistakes because they don't want to leave an impression that they are not good enough. Uh, they also judge other people the same way. 
So if somebody makes mistakes, if they are leaders in a position of leadership or if they are parents, if somebody makes mistakes in their team or if their children make mistakes, they judge them are not, not to be, uh, as being incapable, as not being smart, not being intelligent, and not uh, having what it takes to be successful. Because they don't think as mistakes as something that is positive, as something that is uh, normal uh, on uh, the path uh, to learn and to succeed. Uh, so they judge people and they categorize them as smart, good, intelligent, capable, strong, etc. And as people who are weak, dumb, uh, not capable, uh, naive, etc. So uh, that also reflects on the way that they, uh, they behave in, in life in general. So essentially there are uh, two beliefs and these two beliefs of growth versus fixed lead to different conclusions about the meaning of events around us. So uh, these mindsets, these two different mindsets become like lenses through which we uh, interpret uh, our experiences in life. Uh, and that is very important because if we view mistakes as uh, a, an excuse or as an attribution of incapability, uh, we try to, uh, uh, we behave in a different or we respond in a way that demonstrates this lens. Meaning, if we fail at an exam, we stop trying because our failure means that we are not good enough, we are not smart enough. If we're trying to learn a new skill in our job uh, and we don't necessarily take the best video ever, or if we, we try to program something and the coding uh, goes wrong, that becomes a proof for us that, well, maybe we are not talented enough. And that's a big issue. Talent is used a lot with people uh, with a fixed mindset. Uh, they are big on talent. Everybody is a genius uh, or not. Uh, although if you think of people who are very smart, people who are very talented, people who are very accomplished in their fields, from Albert Einstein to Oprah to uh, Elvis Presley to the Beatles, anybody, all these individuals who now we think of as people who are uh, leaders in their fields, uh, people who are idols, they all were rejected in the beginning of their careers. They were all told that they are not good enough. Uh, even Darwin was uh, uh, disposed by, by his father. So all these individuals started by making mistakes and they were not welcome. Uh, they were challenged in the beginning of their careers and yet they were resilient and they were capable of overcoming these challenges uh, because they believed in their abilities and they believed that they can progress if they put more effort into things. So these interpretations shape our narrative of the world. We understand the world in uh, 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 depending on the way that we think uh, and depending on our mindset. The meanings that we make determine our behaviors. Uh, and if we are not convinced of our competence and of our ability, even the best resources that we have will not be able to help us accomplish our goals. Because if you don't believe that you are good enough, if you don't believe that with effort you will succeed, uh, no matter the circumstances around you, you will not be able to succeed. Uh, and that is a very important aspect of growth mindset. And I have this picture up here because it uh, demonstrates the saying, uh, you can lead a horse to, to the water, but you can't make it drink. So you can provide resources to your team members, but if your team members are convinced that they are not good enough, then you can't really do anything about it. So it's very important to, uh, to have a growth mindset in order to achieve our full potential. Now, how do these differ, these two mindsets, lead individuals, uh, down the line to two different uh, pathways. When it comes to goals, individuals with a fixed mindset are interested in looking smart. They want to look smart for themselves and they want to look smart in front of other people. So in a lecture, they're not really interested in asking questions, although that question is a very, it might be a very important question for them to understand a certain concept, for example, uh, just because they don't want to look that they don't know everything, they uh, will not ask questions uh, because that is their goal. They just want to look smart. They're not interested in learning something new. They don't want to embarrass each other, uh, themselves. While people with a growth mindset, they are more interested uh, in learning. Uh, and that's the, their ultimate goal, regardless of the way that they get there, uh, whether it uh, leads to them making mistakes or em embarrassing themselves. Uh, regarding effort, uh, people with a fixed mindset think that effort uh, is a reflection of their inability. So if you're studying hard for the, for the exam, uh, if you're reporting on a story and it takes you so much time, it means that you are not good enough and that you are not talented. Uh, while people with a growth mindset 
view effort as a necessary part of success, uh, an important part of developing yourself in growing and in becoming better uh, than what you were. So effort is positive for people with a growth mindset and it's a negative uh, element in people with a fixed mindset. In reaction to failure, usually people with a fixed mindset think of failure as proof that they are not smart enough or good enough, while people with a growth mindset essentially work harder because they think that with the effort that we have put, we didn't achieve a result, therefore we should work harder in order to learn something new and to uh, develop our abilities. So to illustrate this, facing uh, in response to challenge or failure, or in response uh, to being told that they are not good enough, people with a growth mindset usually increase their effort levels, which leads to higher achievement levels. Because as, as we all know, higher, harder work and uh, more uh, effort leads to higher achievement. And that mean, uh, leads them to believe in the growth mindset even more. So it becomes uh, a cycle of success to them. People with a fixed mindset though, when they are faced with challenges uh, and faced with failure, they usually reduce effort because they think that uh, they are not good enough uh, and uh, they believe that effort is a reflection of inability uh, and that leads them to lower achievement levels because they are not putting the work they are not putting uh, the effort that it takes uh, to achieve results. And this lower achievement, when they see that others are achieving more than they are, that becomes a, a cycle uh, of failure or a vicious cycle for them. So their low achievement levels proves to them that they are not good enough. Believing that they are not good enough leads to less effort and more negative emotions and becomes a cycle that they are trapped in and can't get out of. Now, as I told you earlier, the growth mindset or mindsets in general are interested to me, interesting to me because I'm a neuroscientist. And mindsets were able to demonstrate to us that the way that we think, the way that we face challenges, and the lens that we use to interpret things around us affects our nervous system and affects our brain. As you probably all know, the central nervous system is formed of the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, the majority, 100 billion neurons, they have these cell bodies inside our brain. And they extend, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, they extend, the cell bodies are usually in the brain, uh, in the cortex, and they go all the way, they extend something that we know as axons, and that axon extends and goes down the midbrain to the medulla, down all the way to the spinal cord, which is here. And usually these are motor neurons, so if they are motor neurons, they extend to the muscles and they control our muscle movement. So that's a good example of what uh, a neuron looks like. So this cell body is in the brain and then the axons go all the way down to the motors here. Of course, they form connections within the brain. So these axons here can also form what we call synapses with other neurons and they form networks of neurons that can control different features in our bodies. They also control the way that we think, they also control the way we interpret things, and that's how what the central nervous system looks like. Now, for the longest time in the 20th century, neuroscientists and neurologists assumed and thought that just because neurons don't replicate and they don't divide uh, after a certain age, uh, it means that the brain cannot develop at a later stage in life. So the assumption was that your brain develops, especially as a child, and then it regulates itself in a way that it stops developing by the time that you are a teenager. And then later on in the 90s, uh, uh, I think, it was thought that the brain stops developing when you are in your 20s. Uh, but now we know that, thanks to research that I will tell you a, a little bit about uh, by the end of, of the presentation, we know that the brain never actually stops developing. Now this is uh, electron microscopy, not electron, sorry, light microscopy, showing a single neuron. I'm trying to find my mouse to point it out to you guys. There you go. So this is a cell body of a neuron that I showed you earlier, usually is in the brain. Uh, this is the cell body, and this is a small axon here that usually extends to bind or to find other neurons in the nervous system or to go and uh, find the muscles that it can control. So this is a neuron in culture and look at the way that it develops and moves around. 
trying to found, uh, find other neurons that it can get connected to. All right, so neurons in our brain, we now know are, in always, uh, are always in a form where they are trying to make new connections, bind to new, uh, new synapses, uh, and find networks they, that they can be part of, similar to what we are seeing here in these cells. If you look at the growth cone, uh, this, the growth cone is where the neuron actually makes that synapse or connection with other neurons. And this is another axon. So this axon is from another neuron, and this is going to make a connection with uh, different networks. And this is the tip of the cone that extends from another neuron. And look at the growth cone and the way that it's extending. So it's like the palm of your hand. It's always extending these different uh, dendrites and they're trying to, neurites, sorry, and they are trying to find connections that they can get connected to. So you can see how dynamic it is, just like, and this is, you can see that it's actually pulling the rest of the cell closer. This is the axon here branching. And it's trying to make connections with another neuron uh, that is in its neighborhood. Now, once these, uh, these connections are made, the neurons become connected uh, in a way that will allow them to fire together. Uh, so here is an example of neurons that were labeled with a fluorescent protein. And once they are fired, once they depolarize, usually calcium, there's a, a, a calcium influx, which leads to a certain fluorescent protein to light up under the microscope. So you can see, look at these, look at this network here. And you can see that they light up together, which means that they are firing together. So once they connect to each other, they become one unit. And all this unit works together. So there are other networks around these cells that is not firing with them because it is not connecting, connecting with them. But once they are connected, they start working together. That's another example of a growth cone that is moving along the axon. Now, I'm showing you all these videos because I wanted you to know that our brain is always as dynamic as what we see here. Okay, so now we know that our neurons in the brain are always looking to make new connections, are always trying to form new networks, and these are usually signaled by our effort, our learning process, our development. That's how neurons get triggered to actually express proteins that allow them to make these networks and new connections. All right, so let's talk about interventions. So we, we know that there are two types of people, those who have a growth mindset and those who have a fixed mindset. First question is, can we make people who have a fixed mindset, can we, if we have a fixed mindset, become, uh, become people who think with a growth mindset? And two, how does that affect our brain? So an intervention that was done by Carol Dweck and her group uh, took a number of students uh, in their seventh grade and they uh, identified them as growth versus fixed mindset. And usually they have a survey and they answer questions like, can you develop, can your brain develop? Uh, what is uh, the most important thing to you? Is it the learning or is it impressing other people, etc.? So they were able to decipher people who have a growth versus a fixed mindset. And they looked at their test scores, their math scores specifically here in uh, this graph. And then they did an intervention that lasted for um, no more than five days. And in that intervention, they explained what growth mindset is. They explained, similar to what I explained to you, how our brain keeps developing throughout our life, that knowledge is nothing but us putting the effort in to form these new networks, new connections, and new synapses between different neurons within the brain. And that the more effort we put, the stronger these synapses are, the stronger that these networks are, uh, and the more uh, probability that we become better in life. So uh, this is the intervention. Uh, and uh, they followed these students down the line uh, to, uh, to see how they did uh, in, in class. So here uh, the graph shows people who received that intervention, who had a fixed mindset before the intervention, and in red you can see the students who are in the control group that didn't receive any intervention, who have a fixed mindset here. And then they found that students with a growth mindset, their scores actually increased and improved with time, uh, and the gap between students with a growth mindset compared to students who did not receive the intervention actually grew. So people who 
didn't receive the intervention and had a fixed mindset, their scores went down with time. And these are the, uh, their scores in high school. While people who received a growth mindset intervention, uh, their scores actually improved with time which is very important because it tells us that we can change people's perceptions from fixed to growth mindset and the effects are long lasting. Now, when we looked at the brains of people who have uh, a growth mindset, we were actually capable to differentiate, uh, to find out that with the growth mindset intervention, uh, students can actually form uh, uh, more dense synapses in regions that have to do with the motor speech area. These are people or students who receive uh, interventions in growth mindset and were given exams on vocabulary tests, as well as in the anterior cerebellum uh, that is related to uh, executive function and math, uh, uh, math skills. So these synapses here, the increased number of synapses, is proof that with these interventions, you can actually increase the density of synapses and therefore change the morph morphology as well as the physiology of your brain, which is a very strong uh, indicator of how these interventions and trying to achieve a growth mindset in our daily life and our understanding of brain malleability and brain plasticity and how it develops actually affects the way that our brain works from the inside. Now, I told you that people with a fixed mindset are more focused on getting the result. Uh, people with a growth mindset, they are focused on the learning itself. And to test this idea, uh, we were able to look at the brains uh, of those with fixed versus a growth mindset as they were given the feedback. And we found that growth-minded individuals show superior accuracy after making mistakes. So the growth mindset individuals in this uh, schematic here, uh, growth mindset is associated with enhancement of the error positivity component, which reflects more attention to mistakes. And it means that after you give them the feedback, after you give them the score, you give them the feedback and explain to them what was the mistake and how you can solve the problem, uh, their brain is very active. So fixed-minded people, on the other hand, uh, they usually ignore their mistakes and choose to blame external factors. And when we are giving them the feedback and the correct answers to their mistakes, uh, their brain is almost dead. You don't see any activity here, which is indicated in the red line in this schematic. Uh, and that's very important because if your brain is firing while you are receiving the feedback and if you are receiving uh, the explanation for the mistakes, it means that you are trying to understand that information and retain that information to correct your uh, your mistakes in the future or people with a fixed mindset don't really do that uh, because they don't care about how uh, to correct their mistakes and what the right answer is they only care about the grade or the score because they want to prove to others and to themselves that they are good enough uh, and that's all they're focused on Nael we have a question also from Anna Dovati that's it's part of the team of the NVL she, yes. She's saying that normally this encouragement of trying risk and moving an extra mile begins mm -hmm. when we are a child. How to overcome some bias toward ourselves when we are adults and we did not have this emotional support in the early ages? Right, yeah, that's a very important question. Uh, and, and that's what the interventions uh, that, that we're talking about are for. Uh, so these interventions, it's, I'm going to give you some suggested readings by the end of the presentation. Okay. And I think these readings are very important because they illustrate to you how your brain develops and how mistakes actually improve uh, and make you better in whatever it is that you are doing, in whatever field that you are. Uh, so the first thing is being cognizant of the fact that making mistakes is part of the learning process. Uh, the second thing is understanding that our brain is very dynamic and it's constantly changing. And the only way that it can change and develop is by us taking new challenges. Uh, and the third is to understand the that the choice is totally ours. Uh, so it's very important to keep reminding ourselves that I do understand how my brain works. I do understand that making mistakes is part of the learning process. And it's very important to be able to make that choice and to take that step is to set goals for ourselves. So making sure that we are setting goals to ourselves and making sure that we are charting 
our progress, that usually encourages, encourages us uh, to maintain that track and to stay on the path of taking more risks, not caring so, too much or focusing too much on the negative and not caring too much about making mistakes. Because if you can see that you are making progress with time, that encourages you and makes you aware that you are doing better and you are improving. So it's okay that if somebody else is telling you that you shouldn't make mistakes, that you are not good enough because you know that you are doing better and you are improving. But I think that these interventions, which usually last for five days, uh, are very helpful. So I'm going to leave you with some resources and maybe I can send you some more because here I'm, I'm going to mention some books in the presentation that are helpful for that. But maybe I can also uh, send you some links that, uh, that you can read uh, and you can try. Uh, so that you can make that step and become more capable of taking risks or understanding uh, your psychology a little bit better. All right, uh, so I hope that's helpful, but uh, let me know if, if there's anything else I can clarify. So talking about um, mindsets is very important, uh, but uh, it's also important for us to understand that Mindsets is just uh, a, was a kind of a gateway into uh, neuroscientists to understand that they can look at the brain and that they can uh, try to discover how brain changes uh, affect our behavior, our thinking, and also how our thinking and our behavior affects our brain, its physiology, its morphology, and its development. And thanks to imaging techniques that are available to us now, we are uh, able to actually look into actions that allow us to foster creativity uh, uh, in people around us, depending on the way that they think and depending on the way that uh, they interact with, uh, with their environment. So recent discoveries from neuroscience research has uh, showed uh, a number of uh, issues that are important. Uh, using functional MRI imaging, we were able to identify certain regions in the brain that are active when creative processing is happening. So, uh, and a good uh, example of that is a study that was done by Sagretal. Uh, and uh, what they did was they used Pictionary, uh, the game that we usually play, uh, to actually put individuals in an fMRI imaging, uh, fMRI machine, uh, and do brain imaging while those individuals were drawing uh, versus when they are doing uh, just regular activities like drawing a line uh, or uh, writing down certain names. Uh, that is a process that is less creative. And they were able by doing that to identify regions in the brain uh, that are associated with higher activity when creativity is involved. They also took samples or uh, numbers of musicians, uh, painters, etc. And scientists were able to identify a region in the brain that is called the default mode network. Now, what is very interesting about the default mode network is that it is a network of neurons. Remember how I showed you neurons firing together? It's a network of neurons or a network of regions in the brain that are separate, that is not uh, uh, close uh, in uh, vicinity to each other. You know how we usually thought of regions in the brain of having a single mode of action. So your uh, lateral frontal uh, cortex, for example, is responsible for motor uh, movement in your uh, right hand, uh, etc. Uh, now we know that actually the brain works in networks and different regions in the brain are associated with different functions. So we were able to identify this default mode network uh, that is uh, usually active when you are performing something creative. And very strangely, this default mode network is also active when you are daydreaming and when you are thinking of the future and while you are thinking of future plans, uh, when you are empathetic, trying to think what other people are feeling or what other people are thinking, which is a very curious finding that we don't know the exact repercussions of. Uh, it is still being studied, but that's a very important finding, uh, you know, knowing that the default mode network is strengthened by daydreaming and it is associated with creative thinking. Now, these regions in the brain uh, were highly activated uh, when uh, more creative thinking was involved and they are less active 
you don't always necessarily want to be creative, right? You're not always trying to create something new all the time. When you are in a meeting uh, whereby you have to remember information from the past and you have to report on certain charts, when you have to actually write down uh, a story that doesn't really uh, need you to be creative, it needs you to just retain information and uh, regain that information from memory, you don't want to be necessarily creative. But there are instances when you need to be creative uh, and then you resort to using the default mode network. Uh, and what's very interesting is that that uh, DMN is uh, uh, associated with uh, people who are more open to experiences, more open to challenges, just similar to what we were saying, that people with the growth mindset who are usually more open to challenges and more open to experiences uh, are, uh, are capable of learning more and learning better and developing themselves. It seems that they are also not just learning better, it seems that they are also developing their default mode network, which down the line needs, leads them to become even more creative. Uh, I thought that's a very important uh, observation that we should uh, remember. So being open to ex new experiences is important to creativity as well. All right, so how can you actually you know, make that change? Uh, what are the things that are associated with you uh, making that change of overcoming stereotypes, developing yourself, developing your abilities, uh, and uh, becoming individuals with a growth mindset rather than individuals with a fixed mindset? One thing is to change our language, right? So the language that we use tells other people about our expectations of them. Uh, it tells them what we believe in, uh, whether we believe them, uh, believe in them or not, uh, and it tells them what our values are. Do we value knowledge? Do we value uh, growth? Do we value uh, self-development and learning? Or do we value results? And that's all we care about. Uh, it also helps them set their own goals and expectations. So higher expectations of success usually lead to higher motivation. Uh, and if we make people feel that we don't expect them to succeed, that they are not good enough, uh, then that means that uh, they will focus more on, on a fixed mindset. They retain a fixed mindset. So the way that we praise individuals has to focus on the effort, regardless of what the result is. So if they put more effort, that's what we should be praising, uh, rather than just praising the end result, whether it is our kids or our team members, etc. Uh, don't judge because brains are malleable, uh, characteristics and our character is malleable. We are always changing, our opinions are always changing and that's just a biological fact. We need to remember that. Things that you thought 10 years ago are not things that you have right now. Your opinions are changing and people's opinions are changing. Their characters are changing just because uh, they have a certain character right now doesn't mean that this will remain the character later on It depends on their environment. It depends on how you help them change because their brain is constantly developing So don't be judgmental It's very important to understand that making mistakes is part of the learning process Everybody around us will be might be judging us for making mistakes uh, We might feel that we are judging ourselves if we make mistakes we need to be blind to mistakes. That is very important, although it is very hard. But if other people can do it, then we can do it also. So, uh, and the easy way of doing it is knowing that our brain is developing and our brain is malleable. And by making mistakes and trying again and correcting these mistakes, which is a very important part, remember that your brain is active when you are paying attention to the feedback that you make after your mistakes. And that's when your synapses are growing and uh, that's when you are forming new synapses. So it's important to understand that. And neuroscience research shows that people who are more open to making mistakes uh, and new experiences are more creative uh, because their default mode network is more active and is stronger. And one thing that I think is very reflective of that idea is uh, a Chinese saying, that says jump and the net will appear. You know, things will be fine. Uh, everything will be okay if you are learning from your mistakes. 
My research also showed that parenting plays a very important, as Anna said, you know, usually kids are very sensitive to feedback. They are sensitive to nurturing uh, and socialization as they are growing up. Parenting plays a very important role in the way that view things around you. Uh, my research shows that there are, we focused on a number of parenting styles uh, and we found that authoritative parenting is much more effective than authoritarian parenting or permissive parenting in fostering self-esteem uh, and academic achievement. Authoritarian parenting is the kind of parenting where parents have a set of rules and the children have to obey those rules. They have to obey their parents' ex expectations with no explanation. This is just the rule and this is what they have to do. Uh, authoritative parenting, on the other hand, is parenting where you have a set of rules that the children have to obey, but parents are open to dialogue. They explain to their children why the rules exist. They are willing to listen to their children's feedback uh, and they are uh, usually attentive to the needs of their children, but the rules do exist. And there's permissive parenting, which essentially is parenting that allows children to be uh, uh, spoiled, if you will, and do whatever it is that they are uh, planning on doing, uh, either because they want, they don't care that much about their children or because they want their children to be happy at all times. So the most effective form of parenting when it comes to self-esteem, and our studies down the line are showing that uh, will show, we, we will publish uh, the results soon. Uh, it also shows that uh, better uh, social skills, better, better mental health is also associated with uh, authoritative parenting, especially when it comes to girls, uh, because girls are usually the ones who suffer the most uh, under authoritarian parenting. Uh, and that comes from an environment uh, that is a Middle Eastern environment, which means that it's, it should even be more prominent and more apparent in uh, societies that are Western societies. It's also important to remember that you shouldn't be making excuses um, because uh, if you uh, make the right attributions, uh, if you don't blame others for your mistakes, uh, if you're not trying to look good, but rather you are trying to indeed be better and do better, uh, you have to take active responsibility for the outcomes. Uh, you can always think of examples where people who, whose circumstances are worse than your circumstances and were able to achieve results. And just like they did, you can't. But the secret to that is to internalize these, uh, uh, these attributions. Take responsibility regardless of the circumstances because only you can develop your own brain. Only you, therefore, can develop your own skills and overcome uh, these uh, circumstances. Uh, neuroscience research has also showed that, and I can share the results of the study with you, has, showed that, has shown that physical activity before uh, a meeting, uh, before a test, uh, before an assignment, uh, leads to higher levels of creativity and higher levels of success. As little as 20 minutes walking, just walking, so not necessarily intensive physical activity, has led to a tremendous amount of increase in the activation of default mode network, the network that is involved in creative thinking uh, and in uh, creative results and problem solution, uh, problem solving. And that's when I said about uh, when I said that you don't always need to be creative. Sometimes in, when you are solving math problems, you don't have to be creative to solve a math problem. Uh, sometimes you need to just solve what's in front of you. So physical activity was good for increasing creative thinking as well as uh, increasing problem solving abilities. All right, so uh, some recommended readings that I think will illustrate uh, various aspects of what I talked about today uh, is uh, Carol Dweck's book, uh, mindset the new psychology of success uh, which a very important which is a very good book to actually start reading and getting knowing more about uh, mindsets and how they affect us and what they are uh, there are two very important books that highlight what neuroplasticity is and the power of our brain our adult brain specifically uh, they are very very valuable books that I recommend that you all read uh, by uh, Norman Deutsch the first is The Brain's Way of Healing, and the second is The Brain That Changes Itself. These two books are very valuable for 
anybody who would like to understand more about neuroplasticity and how our brain, how powerful our brain is in controlling our well-being. Uh, the last book uh, recommended today is uh, Whistling Vivaldi by Claude Steele, a professor in uh, Stanford, uh, whose work on stereotypes and the stereotype threat uh, is very important. And understanding how these stereotypes affect our day-to-day -day behavior, our thinking, uh, is very important to understand, and it will help us overcome these stereotypes. And I definitely would recommend it uh, to you as uh, professionals working in, a, in an area that suffers from uh, stereotype threat uh, and challenges in that sense. So to end it uh, and wrap up, uh, it's very important to remember Eric Hofer's saying, in a time of drastic change, uh, it is the learners who inherit the future. And our time is definitely a time of drastic change. Uh, technology is evolving, our societies are evolving, uh, the politics are evolving, uh, and it's, it's very important to understand that the only way that we can prosper uh, in uh, the future is by, by learning. And by learning, we mean making mistakes, uh, always remembering that our brain is in constant flux. It's always developing and forming networks that will allow us to prosper in the future. Uh, remember that the choice is yours. You personally can choose whether you want to belong to a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. Uh, and that means that you will be able to adjust your behavior accordingly. Uh, mistakes are a must. If you want to learn, you will have to make mistakes. These should not be a threat to you. Uh, that is part of you growing. Uh, nobody has learned without making any mistakes. Uh, you will always learn. You will never be perfect. Uh, you'll never be somebody who will never make mistakes. And you should enjoy the process of, of learning rather than being busy with making judgments about yourself and about other people. The only way that you can respond to mistakes is by paying attention to why that was made and uh, making more effort. Uh, your brain is growing and only you can make a judgment about who you are and what you are. So don't let, let anyone uh, define you uh, what you can and what you, what you can't accomplish is up to you uh, and that's the only way to prosper that's the only way to succeed and more importantly that's the only way to actually develop your brain and become better at what you do uh, that's that's all i have for today and I'm, you know i welcome any questions and you are welcome to get in touch i will be uh, happy to send more uh, resources to maria mariana or leah and they can uh, feel free to share them with the group thank you so thank much now i'm oh, sorry do you want to finish? <laughs> no, that's, that's all I have. Uh, we have also another question from, from Agda. Um, she's yeah. asking if you, do you think it, it is possible to have both mindsets uh, during your life? Because uh, I particularly feel like I passed through different periods with a lot of stimulation in many areas in my life. And then mm -hmm. I got stuck, stuck in a fixed and negative mindset. Yeah, uh, definitely. So uh, we usually have more than just one mindset in different areas. Uh, so it is task specific, actually. So in the area of music, for example, if you are passionate about music and you have an intrinsic uh, motivation to learn music, you can have a growth mindset. You make mistakes, but you just love it. You don't care about you know, making mistakes. Uh, you just practice playing the piano all day long, no matter what others think of you no matter how many times you have to repeat the same symphony over and over again but when it comes to writing essays you just can't stand it because the first mistake that you make is so frustrating and it proves to you that you are not good enough so yes you can have different mindsets depending on different tasks and depending on what stage in your life you are in and that's why we have shown that interventions are very important and interventions are designed for people who have a fixed mindset so that they can change and switch into having a growth mindset. So definitely uh, the change uh, is very, uh, not easy, but it's very probable to happen as long as you are cognizant of the problems, uh, the factors and the elements that caused you to have a fixed mindset uh, and how a growth mindset works by understanding the neuroscience of it and understanding the psychology of it, which is very easy actually. Uh, you can definitely make that change. Uh, so that's why I said that ch the choice is yours. 
uh, and I'll be sending you with the characteristics of each mindset so that you can make choices depending on, uh, on each one of them. And hopefully it will be a growth mindset. Yeah. And well, that's, there's also two more questions. Um, is there any relation between fixed mindset and depression? Is a question from Anna Adawati also. Yeah, it's more associated with depression because uh, a fixed mindset usually uh, is also associated with uh, a feeling of feelings of helplessness. So people with a fixed mindset usually externalize attributions. Uh, and depression is also, to a large extent, is associated with feelings of helplessness and disappointment. Uh, and therefore, uh, a fixed mindset, somebody with a fixed mindset, is more vulnerable uh, to become depressed. It doesn't mean that they have to be depressed, uh, uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's not a must. But uh, they are more, more vulnerable to being depressed uh, because they suffer from more anxiety, from more feelings of helplessness, from more externalization of attributions. Uh, so people with a growth mindset usually internalize attributions and uh, therefore try to take responsibility and understand that they can change their circumstances uh, and they enjoy the process of, of the learning, so they are less focused on making judgments about themselves, judgments about others, uh, which helps uh, in, in terms of uh, overcoming depression. Uh, so they are more likely to be to become uh, depressed. And the last one is from uh, Luisa. She's saying, mm -hmm. as journalists, we have a big responsibility regarding public information. Mistakes can be very damaging to the public and have profound impact in society. It is possible to recon reconcile, reconcile this, the impact that one mistake in our file can have, with the grown mindset view about the importance of mistakes. I personally find it difficult to be more easygoing about mistakes, and I think this is because I'm a journalist. Right. Um, can you repeat the first part of the question? Sorry, I didn't answer yeah, so, that. So she's saying it is possible to recon reconcile this, the impact. She's, she's talking about the impact that one mistake in our mm -hmm. files can have with the grown mindset view about the importance of mistakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you're saying that maybe we should not be so forgiving with mistakes because the growth mindset saying uh, says that you know mistakes are part of the learning process uh and you know that's depending on the context though it depends on the context if it's in the context of your work as a journalist you don't want to uh people not be accountable for uh for what they do uh, you want people who are in uh positions of responsibility to be accountable and you want them to do the best that they can uh, to actually lead to the progress of society and community, for example. Uh, that doesn't mean that you should necessarily judge those individuals as people who never change. So you can still report on the mistake, the repercussions of the mistake and trying to correct the mistake because that's a very important aspect of being okay with individuals making these mistakes. Uh, is trying to give them the feedback to correct those mistakes. There has to be an intention and a will of those individuals to actually correct those mistakes, to understand them. Because if you're a team leader, for example, and people in your team make mistakes all the time, that will lead to negative repercussions. If you don't believe that those individuals are any way interested in developing themselves, in overcoming these mistakes and make them correct, then it's not your fault. Uh, it's their fault, uh, but it's important to make it clear to them what your values are uh, and to highlight the mistake when it happens uh, so that they can correct it and make it right. Now, what I'm saying is that it's important not to judge those people and make them feel that they are not capable and they are not good enough uh, so that they can have the potential to correct that mistake if they intend to. If you're talking about things that you are reporting on in public service, of course, you have to highlight the mistakes and you have to report on them so that either the individuals who created them or individuals around them who can, uh, can hold them accountable for them and correct them. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that you have to make judgments, personal judgments about the ability of those individuals, uh, especially if they are willing to listen and to take feedback so that they can grow 
and they can correct their mistakes. So it depends on the context. Uh, but as team leaders, it's very important to spread that value of development uh, and curiosity and attentiveness so that you can correct the mistake if you have the will to correct it. Okay, so and anyone has any other question? Girls? I do. I'm writing it down now. Mari Marta, I think you can ask if you want, <laughs> if it's okay with, with that. Okay. Um, I'd like to know how to respond, how to react in environments where, like newsrooms and some kind of offices, which don't have this kind of mindset and where feedbacks and mistakes are not that welcome. And instead of being encouraged to improve, you end up being like punished or condemned or judged. Like how to respond to that. Right, uh, so there are toxic environments. Uh, you know, the research can't really do much to address uh, environments that are not willing to endorse a growth mindset. Uh, what, we can, what you can do is try to convince individuals who are responsible in those contexts to actually change and make the shift. Now, an environment where you are being judged for making mistakes uh, and endorsing, uh, endorsing a growth mindset does not seem to be happening. It's very hard. Uh, but what you can do is try to hopefully refer people to uh, research that shows the importance of having a growth mindset uh, so that that environment that is toxic uh, can improve and become a little bit better, a little bit more fostering uh, of that. Uh, one thing that is important uh, for environments that are toxic and don't seem to be willing, despite your effort to actually change it into a growth mindset environment, is to maybe challenge yourself uh, or judge yourself a little bit less uh, and try to find a different environment that will al allow you to thrive. Uh, because there's one of two things that you can do. Either change your environment, meaning try to change what you are currently is living in uh, by showing research and highlighting research and stories of the importance of a growth mindset. Uh, and of course, you have to be putting more effort and to understand why you are making the mistakes. So if people around you see and see you demonstrating that you are putting more effort and trying to correct the mistakes that you are doing, hopefully they will become more accepting uh, of, uh, of these ideas of growth mindset. Or you can be uh, less worried about what they are thinking and more focused on the progress that you are making, at least until you get more responsiveness from them for them to become more endorsing of a growth mindset. There isn't much you can do if you are in a very toxic environment that is not accepting of anything about growth mindset uh, and creativity. Uh, and anyway, this kind of environment will self-destroy uh, down the line. So you can either try to change it or you can, uh, you know, try to find a new environment, unfortunately. There's also another... There are, many, I have to say that I have, there are many resources. Uh, I don't know the context that you're working in, but there are human resource departments that are endorsing the importance of a growth mindset and environment that fosters creativity. So maybe you can find somebody uh, that is uh, capable of understanding what you're trying to do and achieve and they can take it over themselves to actually do professional training for people in the offices, get guest speakers to highlight the importance of growth mindset for the benefit of creativity, for the benefit of the work environment itself. Uh, it's not easy to not have anybody who's responsive to that. Uh, so that's th one thing that you can do. But uh, you know, it's worth trying because if you don't try, then you will not get anywhere. Um, I hope that's helpful. And Isabel is asking also, do you believe that using inclusive language in gender topics and issues, a, a good strategy to change the mindset of an audience um, can, and eventual, can eventually break stereotypes? I think that's the question, right, Isa? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So do you believe that uh, using inclusive language in gender topics and issues, a good strategy to change the mindset of an audience, can eventually break stereotypes? I believe so. Uh, we haven't done research specifically on that, uh, 
but I, I believe so because you're trying to break down these silos uh, and by breaking down these silos you are breaking down the stereotypes the definition of stereotyping as we said in the beginning is that you're trying to create negative stereotypes concepts negative emotions about an out group an out group is anything that is not similar to you so when you're trying to be more inclusive creating or coming up or maintaining these stereotypes becomes harder uh, to break down. Now, you might face pushback on changing that language and using an inclusive language because it is threatening to those stereotypes. Stereotypes are very hard to change because they're associated with emotions and they are very uh, integral to the way that we understand the world. Uh, so it is normal that you might uh, find some pushback, but you should become more inclusive so that you can create an in-group rather than out-group perspective uh, towards people. So, uh, you know, as I said, we haven't done the research on that switch and how that affects uh, stereotypes in the work environment, uh, but uh, that is definitely something that's powerful. Another thing that is powerful is having storytelling uh, sessions uh, between an in-group and an out-group, and that's something that we have tried. Uh, we have created an environment or uh, an experiment where uh, individuals from two different communities come together and tell each other stories about their background and their life uh, and certain aspects of their development and how they were raised. Uh, and that was very powerful in breaking down these stereotypes and incre uh, in increasing inclusiveness. Uh, so you can definitely also try to, to work on that, maybe have people uh, give their background story, uh, their journey, uh, or highlight certain events in their life that, uh, that has affected them. Uh, that creates empathy, and empathy is a good way to breaking down these stereotypes. Okay, so, um, well, if nobody has any more question, I want to very, thank you, thank you so much. And Mariana had to leave because she probably is in a flight right now. <laughs> Uh, yeah. but thank you so much because I really feel all what you mentioned today is very valuable for well personally like in um in a process when you're trying to develop your own project and you always have a lot of barriers that can be in the process but then you see like a light in the in the end of the tunnel when you think about ground mindset and I think this is very powerful for us and maybe um, most of the girls that are here when you when you have to think how to react when you have a problem or you have a barrier or you have something to face and it makes you more conscious of of the process and the way you you react with your language and and the way you think about yourself in that in those moments right absolutely so, uh, and you. as i said you always need to remember that it's your choice the way that you react to circumstances around you is up to you and you can either choose the path that leads to more brain development, more personal growth, or uh, to actually join the chorus and blame yourself in a negative way and judge yourself. Uh, and uh, remember that your brain would prefer you to choose the growth path. Uh, and examples from history has shown that individuals who choose more effort and chose to be okay with making mistakes are the ones who achieve success. So hopefully, hopefully that will be the result of the talk. Okay. Well, thank you, Nell, for your time, for being here today with us, and and we'll hope to to keep with you in touch. And and I know you're gonna be a mentor also, so that's I guess very great. And I guess a lot of girls uh, want to be in touch with to have more conversation and, and you know, like okay. send you some questions probably. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I would love to hear back from you, uh, and we'll definitely be in touch. Hopefully, I'll get to see all of you uh, in person at some point. Yeah, we hope so that. And thank you all the girls that are here and that were like paying so much attention and so interesting on this topic. Um, and well, I guess we just finished the, the, the talk and the call. And so we see you like in a, in a few months, I guess, right? All right. Okay, Nael, thank you so all much. Right. Bye bye. See you. Bye. Bye.